And of course, we, we're increasingly seeing more and more generic repositories, things like Zenodo, which we're about to, to, to hear about later, things like Dryad and others, um, who can't work in the same way as disciplines repositories. And some people say that as a result that they simply shouldn't exist. Well, they, they do exist. Uh, we're in a world that lives with them, and I think we need to understand how we can apply uh, quality processes that work across all of these domains. Well, there is some, some help at, at, at hand. Uh, work uh, was done uh, in the 1990s uh, by, amongst others, uh, Wang and Strong, uh, who wrote a paper called Beyond Accuracy, What Data Quality Means to Data Consumers. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of what they did, but I'm going to, or how they did it. But they did an analysis, actually, which was looking at not so much of research data, but data in, in, diff in different contexts of use, in government, in planning, uh, in the commercial area, but it's applicable to research data as well. I think it's interesting to look at because not all of the data that researchers are interested in comes from the academy. And some of the data that's produced there has uses outside the academic context. Data does move between government, academic, commercial, and public spheres, and therefore we should have means of managing it that make that transition easier again, that help reduce in as many ways as possible. So they came up at the end after a long, long process, which you can uh, look at if you want to go look at their paper, with 20 different generic measures uh, of quality, some of which are intrinsic to the data itself, its accuracy, uh, for instance, uh, some of which are more to do with the systems that we use to get at the data. So it's accessibility, for instance. Um, it's interpretability. I think research repositories tend to focus on some of these aspects, to the exclusion of others. And they often use, as I said, domain-specific terms to describe them. Now, I don't, I don't think Wang Strong aren't the only people who've looked at this. Other people have come up with slightly different measures. Uh, and there are some important things that are hidden in that analysis. So cost actually is in there somewhere, but it's not immediately apparent. Uh, that it is, and there are some things that are conflated, which in some domains we would say are, it's very important to distinguish, such as the difference between accuracy and, and precision. But I'm going to set those, what I think are small uh, caveats aside for the moment. This is not the complete story, but it is an analysis, it is a demonstration that we can have quality measures that are very, very generic and that apply to, to, to all sorts of data, and that help us to some issues of capability and help us decision-making in curation processes. Because I think if we think harder about these things, and we think which of these dimensions uh, we're trying to improve, and if we develop processes and tools that are more generic, amongst the benefits we gain are greater mobility for the professionals that we're training in data curation, that increasingly they'll be able to move between research domains and apply skills that at the moment they may not realize are generic, which actually are generic. We'll have tools that we can reuse more easily between research domains. And this has been demonstrated in my own group, and indeed a, a similar group in the States who work for the US National Archives, use a lot of very generic tools to do some of the analyses and the data that we were getting in. Uh, we, we, it was simply not possible to have domain specific tools, and we did do that. We couldn't, but we had to automate some of the quality processes that, that we were doing. Can be done. The training that emphasizes the transferable skills is also an advantage to us. And most importantly, when think about maximizing data reuse, if we describe quality in a generic way, it makes it that much easier to get the interoperability we're talking about to integrate data from disparate sources without error. But at the moment, sometimes we can bring together data and not realize that different quality parameters are being applied and therefore end up, perhaps, with bad science uh, at the end of it. So I think by being explicit about the metrics and explicit about curation processes in the main independent ways, we can allow greater choice by consumers. We can look harder at the costs, the relative costs and the benefits of applying different processes. So I'm, I'm quite conscious in the past, for instance, that, that we applied what, what a typical process at the archive that, that, that I ran, which meant that we put a lot of effort into each individual data set. And as a result, there were many, many government data sets we were not able to deal with. There was a fixed budget for this work. And in retrospect, perhaps we should have thought differently and said, well, if, if, we, if we decide to use a different set of parameters, would it be better to save more data 
but to lose some of the other aspects of quality, would, in a sense, the greater quantity triumph over the lower quality of each of the things we say. We never really gave people that choice, and we made it for ourselves. And I think, in retrospect, we should have done that. We should have had a greater understanding of this. Others have done a good analysis of this. Brian Lawrence, for instance, gave a talk at the IDCC conference in 2008, in which he looked at those decisions, the balancing of, uh, of, of cost against quality uh, in some debt. Uh, and I think there's more that could be done there. But also, what we need to do is express that quality in terms that are machine-readable and interoperable to enable the automated integration of, of multiple systems. At the moment, that example I showed you in my own archive was written in narrative English. That was derived from an automated analysis where we could also have expressed, have provided that quality analysis in a machine-readable form. We didn't. Uh, and again, in, in, in retrospect, <laughs> that is a decision that we should have changed. I think what we want to be able to do is to keep both of these potential customers happy. The person who just wants whatever you've got now, they're willing to put in all the effort to clean up the bad things about it because for them, uh, timeliness is everything. And, and the other person with the equally valid case that says, you know, I've spent my life cleaning up other people's bad data, I'm sick of it. You know, go on and, and, and apply your process when the data's ready, tell me about it and I'll use it. At the moment, we focus too often on the second case there. I know, uh, at least one well-known data repository in uh, uh, something called the, the, the World Data System that talks with pride of the fact that it can take four years between a data set being given to them and it being made available to the public. For them, that's a demonstration of the quality that they had. Um, I'm, I'm sure they do add lots of quality. I'm not sure that waiting four years for the data to go through that process is always a good thing. Perhaps there are some people who wish they would satisfy the person at the top and not the person at the bottom. By making the quality data machine readable, we ought to be able to make, in a simple way, assertions like this about individual values, being able to say this one is highly accurate, about an entire variable, to say something about its precision, and to say despite the fact that that is highly accurate and that variable uh, is highly precise, unfortunately, the data set as a whole is not complete. That's the typical sort of thing you often want to say about research data, and in fact, that's quite a simplified example. And again, we often say this in, in, in narrative form, in a way that requires people to, to read the description of the data set and make a decision. That's fine when you're using one data set. It is not fine when you need to integrate a thousand data sets in order to do your research. So I think looking at the future again, we want to make those, so we want to use more automated tools to make those assertions about quality and make the machine readable to help that case of automated aggregation, to help big data, large amounts of data emerge from the aggregations of many, many small sets of data. To enable data to be released from the silos of particular disciplines where we express these assertions about quality in terms that are only comprehensible to a small set uh, of people and to enable non-disciplinary repositories to play a greater role in the nature of ecology. They're going to do that anyway. These issues around ecology will help them play, play that part. It will help the disciplinary archives themselves, who often do a very, very good job and have advantages of scale. It will help them expand beyond the specialist disciplines that they operate in at the moment. And most critically, it will help us spend the limited budgets that we have, and budgets are often becoming more limited, to the best effect. We will know that we're spending money in ways that we want to, that we're applying intensive and expensive processes uh, on quality uh, on the, on, in the areas that we really care about, and that where it makes sense to have diversion processes in two sets or four sets of data to have available, we will do that. Thank you very much.